Welcome back. Synchro is playing a handicap game with a professional as a result of winning a tourney two series. And this is the handicap game that he's playing here is the prize for uh, his accomplishment. So uh, let's enjoy this game together. Uh, so this is from the pro's perspective. Sorry, I'm getting myself turned about. We, of course, are rooting for our compatriot, our fellow flagmate, uh, Synchro. Thanks uh, again to Shogi Harbor and the generosity of the uh, whichever organization she's coordinating with to coordinate this event and the permission of the JSA to perform such things. Uh, the rest of the world is the better for it. So. I will do the best I can to attempt to provide commentary tonight. Um, I myself have not studied Handicap Joseki yet, so hopefully that won't be too burdensome for me. One thing you do note frequently in Handicap gameplay is the advancement of these generals. There's gold, silver, gold, and silver. The further these are up the board, the fewer spaces you have to move your pieces, so it's paramount that you play actively and with intention with intention pardon me so um yeah so here a uh, handicap giver proceeds to take more and more space in the center and the left side of the board and they may or may not be planning to use the knight soon I assume the knight will jump into play as soon as it finds a target. I assume the king will move left or right once it becomes clearest which direction is safest for the king to move. Meanwhile, Synchro uh, is cruising right along here, has exchanged a pawn already, and with the pawn in the hand, hopefully we'll find some initiative somewhere. They've applied pressure on the right side of the board, so... Handicap Giver is moving to the left side. This should be quite exciting. I do remember the first time we had one of these handicap series. I think the pro and the players somehow managed to schedule all of their games at the same time. And so we were all on the front edge of our seats watching all the games simultaneously. And it was a bit overwhelming for everyone. Um, except the pro. The pros are quite strong. They are ready. So, um, yeah, tonight, uh, this match was scheduled perhaps when people are having dinner or most people might be sleeping. Um, this is scheduled so people can watch it, enjoy it with their dinner, or, you know, if they're eating with family and such, perhaps they catch the game very soon thereafter. But yeah, we see how Handicap Giver continues to advance in the center of the board, reducing the scope of the bishop. Meanwhile, a Handicap Receiver tries to proceed on the right edge and find some weakness. If there's any crack in the armor, this could be a path for them to advance. A tense moment. Handicap receiver needs to find a breakthrough. Otherwise, they'll continue to get pushed back or pushed back. Um, 
that said, you know, if there were some chink in the armor, perhaps our pro would have thought twice before. I mean, yes, it's a quite desperate situation. Uh, as they're playing without Rook, Bishop, or either left or right Lance. So this is referred to as four-piece handicap. It's quite a difficult situation already to begin with. But um, if they were in serious peril, um, they would probably spend longer making their moves than they have here. So this seeks to distract the handicap receiver or givers uh, silver, I guess. They have terms for the giver and receiver. You'll hear them, the giver referred to as Shitata, and the receiver as Uwata. And rather than inject this conversation with a ton of the language, I think I'll try to stick to English because it's the language I happen to know best at this time. Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, I don't think this exchange of a gold for a pawn necessarily is going to help them break through. I can see where they might imagine that it could. But note that you cannot double your pawns, so you cannot drop another pawn at 1-3. And if you just happen to take the pawn in 1-4, um, well, I'm trying to re reason through this. I thought there would be some obvious detriment to it. Maybe there's not. Hmm. So... I was imagining that after you take on one four, somehow it would get more difficult to continue advancing. But uh, the handicap giver does not have another pawn in hand. What they have in hand is a gold general, not a pawn, so they wouldn't drop that to block the lance. They could chase the lance from behind, but that seems unwise. Um, so... Let's take a minute to pause here and reflect.
I am mildly amused by our quote there. It says, the spectators say the best of the game. So yeah, I think what he had been deciding among was whether maybe to promote on 1-1 one, one, to take on 1-4 or to look for opportunities elsewhere. So taking on 1-4 seems to make sense. It would allow the pawn on 1-2 to promote next turn and be defended by the slants. I'd remarked earlier that if there were some weakness in this armor, that I would expect the handicap giver to have slowed down a little bit. Ah, uh, thank you, Gustav. You remember studying this climbing gold against this handicap, but you're not sure if letting the opponent take the gold was part of the strategy. I'm thinking it might be. Like, you have to, I guess, half intend to um, allow it to be captured. If you're too timid, then you miss out on some chances. Um, so you have to allow for the possibility that it could be taken. As for whether that's plan A, I'm not sure. I've not studied this handicap. And it's fine to play handicap games as if it were just a normal game. You don't have to play handicap strategies, even if handicap strategies are dominant and more likely to win. Uh, it's entirely fine to play them in a way that you just play a normal game and learn something about the normal game of Shogi that way too. So yeah, here we have a breakthrough. So it is possible to drop another pawn. I'm not sure whether it would be at 1-3 or 1-4. I'm not even sure if this would be the right time to drop it. Uh, potentially, you might have some position where you want to move the rook. Um, hmm. So... I guess what I'm looking at is Lance takes Knight, then moving the Rook to the edge file, promoting the Rook, and then whatever follows after that. Um, I assume that's the dominant plan here. Maybe there are other good plans too. Uh, but activating the Rook seems vital. And what better way to activate it um, than by ensuring that the first file stays closed? Um, now I say that, but if somehow the opponent of the handicap uh, giver got a pawn in hand, they could close the first file. So my idea of taking the knight, moving the rook over, and promoting it might be one move too slow here. Instead, after taking the knight, now maybe the idea would be drop a pawn on 1-4. But note here, this is the critical moment where this handicap giver obtains the pawn in hand, which allows them to defend if necessary. Um... I still do, do think that pawn 1-4 looks kind of interesting. I don't know if it's better or worse than 1-5 or 1-3. I don't know. Um, but it would be fantastic to activate the rook. I don't know how easy or hard that would be to do here. But if you move the rook to 1-8... I anticipate pawn drop 1-4. Then is there any way to force the rook into the opponent's position? That's my curiosity. 
possibly also pawn 2-5 being overly generous um, might have some merit. The notion that if somehow they try to defend on the first file, you could start dropping more pawns to break up this silver pawn dynamic that they might have there. It'd be a nice game. You do have a very nice game against Madoka Kitao. This climbing gold strategy. You're reviewing the game record, and you let her take the gold. But you managed to promote your pawn before the gold could be captured. Interesting. Yeah, I remember months and years back, we've had some fascinating games. Um, we had one where uh, the handicap receiver played extremely aggressively and then missed a tactic and it was over. But um, up to that point, their play, it did receive the comment that you be gentle to your pieces, but when you have such a large handicap, sometimes you can get away with some things. Not that it's a good strategy because you have to find all the supporting tactics, but sometimes you can. And it was quite the exciting game up to the point where they missed the tactic. Um, that said, it's probably not encouraged to play such a super aggressive manner unless you're prepared to do it. So I remarked earlier how pawn 2-5 could be interesting. Pawn 2-5 still might be interesting here. I'm not sure. So if you do pawn 2-5, pawn takes pawn, rook 1-8, pawn 1-4, pawn 2-4. And that hits the silver on 2-3 which is supporting a pawn on 1-4. Um, could be interesting. Although maybe if you play pawn 2-5, they attack your knight with a pawn. Hmm. I don't know. The silver on 2-3 doesn't have a lot of spaces to go. And if the silver on 2-3 moves, and can say it goes to 1-4 and you kick it again, it moves again. Then you could start chasing the gold on 3-2. Um, I mean, yeah, you started with a, a large handicap. So, got your chances. But, um, and I do appreciate that. The handicap receivers taking their time, really trying to find some very good moves. But, um, yeah, so... I'm guessing here this might be the moment to drop the pawn. If you don't do that, um, well, I don't know if you even have time for it anymore. The opponent has, or handicap giver, has a gold and a knight and a pawn in hand. So I'm a bit nervous at this point.
so I greatly appreciate that both players are taking this game seriously. Um, it is a handicap game. It's a very difficult handicap uh, for both players. So they're both giving it their all. They're taking their time and thinking things through. I'm trying to imagine. I'd also I'd be nervous in either player's position here. I've not played a whole ton of handicap games before. Um so I have played games like I played one this afternoon where I dropped a bishop for nothing. Um had to fight my way back. And fought very hard and got a bit lucky. Um, but even that sort of situation I find emotionally exhausting or draining. I'm now trying to imagine uh, the situation of a player being expected or... I don't know. I mean, it is a job, and it's a great job. But I would be so nervous if I were on either side of this game. As uh, the amateur player, you're playing against a pro. Pros are extremely awesome at this game. And as the pro, I'd be nervous about having such a strong reputation to live up to every game. So. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, so here we are. It still looks like uh, the handicap receiver has ways they could potentially break through. It's getting more and more challenging by the move, but there still are ideas. Meanwhile, the handicap giver is still trying to find ways to puncture uh, the position and attack the king. But they're having to be quite patient as their forces are stretched thin across both sides of the board. Um, again, it would be fantastic to be able to actively use the rook. Uh, but it's not going to be easy. And note this knight at the top of the board is protecting the pawn on the left edge of the board. Otherwise the bishop would have an easier time activating. So there's a lot to watch out for. Um, note that if a handicap receiver were to move their left edge pawn and try to activate the bishop through the flank, the pawn could be dropped on 7-5 to block the bishop directly. Um, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it, our handicap receiver's got to be really uh, aware of what's going on. And the handicap giver, doubly so. It's unfortunate that... Um, even with such a generous match offer, these games are timed, um, so I guess that's for the benefit of both players, otherwise um, both players could be uh, have incentives to drag on the game and consume many, many more hours than they expected. But, yeah, the tragedy of having a game clock is that eventually some moves get forced. Eventually, uh, one or both players could make mistakes, and it just gets challenging to keep up with it all. This is interesting. Alright, so... 
Yep. Oh, okay. Wow. So I'd mentioned how the handicap givers looking for opportunities to invade and puncture this position around the handicap receiver's king. Well, the knight advancing definitely signals that they're starting an attack here. Um, so, yeah, I'd be nervous. Being nervous doesn't solve anything. Um, I guess what I'm looking at again is pawn 2-5. I don't know if it's too little too late here. Oh, that is really clever. Wow. Wow, I missed that. Um. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually, that does look fine. It would be a different matter if we could force the gold to move to 7-5. But if we did pawn 7-5, the gold would just move back to 6-4. So... This is a decent attempt to activate the bishop. We attack a knight and a pawn at the same time. Um, yeah, this looks bright. Future looks bright for a handicap receiver. So. Um, I'm looking for ways to further improve that, but it's hard. I mean, it would have been... it could have been nice. I don't know if there was time for it again, but, like, if somehow the rook could have activated, that would have been great. I've been so fixated on the rook that I forgot we have this wonderful bishop we can use. Um, so yeah, they tried to keep the bishop locked out. And Byoyomi begins. That's painful. Yes, this promoted pawn is strong. It's going to take at least two more turns to activate. Do they have that kind of time? We'll find out. Well, if you take this pawn, the attack accelerates. Um, oh wow, I didn't did not foresee that. So Hmm. Five pawns in hand, and what to do? And this is not the best position to be dropping another pawn. And that's tempting too, but I'm not sure this bishop move actually... Well... Yeah, I had the first 
I had the same thought as our handicap giver here, that, well, you can just move the gold over. But, um... Hmm. That's not the only option. So, a handicap giver has a difficult choice um, between playing a very heavy defense or trying to somehow attack here. It might be too early for an attack to prevail. And depending how dangerous this position is, an attack might not be available. But, if this attack is crushing, then, then there's time for it. Note that with only pawns in hand, this is not the easiest thing to defend against. So, and this is the trade-off, is that how, I mean, sure, a gold move is still available. Um, it would still slow down uh, the handicap receiver's attack, but, hmm. I'm not sure what follows. It's difficult hoping for both players to play a good game because the game, objectively, each position has one perfect result with perfect play. So if they played this gold move first, then Bishop eight eight would not be available on account of the knight fork on seven six. But since this is played second, that means that they're playing. Yeah, this bishop. Oh. Okay, I did. I was earlier trying to think about and try to recommend this. With the gold still hanging on seven four. In this position, I'm a bit nervous about recommending this attacking idea. This gold on 6-4 is well defended. Arguably, maybe it's a wall that somehow traps the king, but I don't know if I buy that. Seven pawns in hand and nowhere to drop them. Okay, that noise means somebody's commenting on the game. Um, I do see Lily indicating some arrows on the board. This threatens both to promote on 8-8 eight, eight, as well as to capture on 5-7. Our handicap receiver sped up a little bit, playing the moves very quickly. Um, I'm guessing that just means they're nervous. Um, but yeah, moving quickly does not increase your winning chances. Unless... <laughs> okay, we have a W shape, thanks to Iron Gray. Um, oh boy. Oh me oh my. Well... Either hope. Um, um, yeah, I'm struggling to comment on this. It looks spooky. I mean, this is what it's all been building up to, right? So this threatens to drop a piece on 4-8. Um, I guess a turn again. No, there was no calming the attack down through other means. Um, 
20秒12ですと、レイズ・ディ・アタック・バイ・ワン・ムーブ。As it will take one turn to capture the pawn. So, yeah, there continues to be a host of threats against our handicap receiver's king, which is caught unaware in the middle of the board.、Um, it's not a great situation. That's what I impulsively would have come up with, too. That again continues to delay the attack by one turn. The reality, though, is that unless we can draw this king into somewhere where a tactic's available, such checks aren't going to help defend your own king. So I anticipated bishop takes gold here, which introduces three mate threats, one on. Uh, 6 8, 1 on 5 8, 1 on 4 8.、Um, so, it's a difficult situation, of course.、Um, maybe some tactic crops up. Maybe somehow the dragon re enters the game with tremendous effect. I don't know. Seems difficult.、Um, so the question, I guess, is the king run left, center, or right?、Uh, by that I mean 756555.、Spectators are all excited about this. I do hope someone will be available to translate、um, post game analysis, as I'm not in a position to do so. Um, Alright, this concludes the game. Well played. Played both players.、Uh, so, this is a handicap game for a winner of one of our、uh, Tourney 2 series. Thanks again to Shogi Harbor and our community and、uh, Japan for making this match possible. I'm afraid I'm not in a position to do translation here. No better than the players, anyhow. And,、um, so, part of the reason for doing this video is that even though I cannot translate,、uh, perhaps someone else viewing this may be able to make the best of it. I see. Thank you very much.、Uh, Shogi Renme Taikai? Taikai? I'm not sure how to say that.、Uh, Takano says something that's roughly equivalent to the result was disappointing, but it was a great game. That was an exciting game for sure. Yeah, we can see that、um, our handicap receiver played with great spirit. Oh. Oh, great. I do hope that they. That、um, a handicap receiver takes up this opportunity to take a look back at the game. We are quite, I'm quite hopeful.
So I see a question mark at the end of this phrase. And at the beginning of the phrase, I see a gold. But that's about the extent of my understanding, unfortunately. So here we have this position. I presume what's being asked about is um, this interesting gold sacrifice that transpired. Was it a strategy to attack with the gold? So yeah, this is actually something I think we've seen in another teaching ladder game, or not teaching ladder, in another handicap game with a pro that we've seen before that um, I don't recall where this comes from, but I think this is unique to handicap games. This is actually a strategy. I think so. I could be corrected. Um... I definitely don't want to butt in and try to correct anyone, given my lack of knowledge on the subject. Um, so I see the first symbol on that string there, I think, is a token, or toe. Um, yeah, so this was a strategy that I think is played for handicap games, and I think we've seen it. It's been months or years since we've last observed it, but it's, if my memory serves me right, and I'm not sure about this, I think Kaufman wrote... Um, well, he did write about uh, handicap game strategy. I don't know whether this particular strategy is attributed to him or if this is somebody else's invention. So, yeah, it's at this time I do mention my gratitude that previous encounters where we've had pros available, having um, immediate translation services available was extraordinary. Um, and the notion that here we do still have translation uh, strategy, or we do have translation available, is quite good. Um, yeah, it helps both the pro and the amateur learn something together. Yeah, this is... I'm surprised just how effective this plan was. This strategy can be. So here we have another moment. Yeah, the gold was taken. But yeah, the files 1 and 2 are both well broken. Yeah, I'm quite impressed, honestly. This makes a good impression on me. That if I were to play this handicap, this might be a strategy I employ. Um, it seems really effective. At some point, um, probably outside of today's live stream, I am curious about just how to completely break in. Um, uh, uh, so I'll leave it to the pro to say something in response to this. Um, but yeah, I had my many questions about um, most effective pond suji. How best could you use pawns to break up something here and make use of uh, the handicap receivers, bishop and rook? I'm sure there's more than one way to do it, but I'm just curious what the options to consider even are. 
I kept coming up with pawn 2-5 as an interesting candidate. Although I do like this knight drop. It scares me a bit because it feels heavy. But the silver is the only piece defending the 5-5 five five pawn, so this might be the perfect time to drop the knight there. When otherwise the 5-5 five five pawn just disappears. And maybe the right answer is that maybe the handicap giver has to give up the 5-5 five five pawn in this circumstance, and it's just a really difficult situation. I don't know. So Synchro's message has been relayed to the pro. The pro is making some remarks in response. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, the translator relays. Actually, you are using your pieces quite well here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't want to butt into this conversation. And... But yes, the pro raises a very good point. Actually, like this, it's quite compelling. It's impressive. Um, you don't have to move your pieces. You don't have to like move your forward most pieces for them to be effective. They've done their job. They've done a terrific job. And... Um, yeah, that's actually quite a difficult position for the handicap giver at this point. Yes, I'd be a bit sad that I'd have promoted pieces on 1-1 one, one, and 2-1, but they've done a great job. And they make a foothold for other pieces to enter. So I didn't see any better way to use those pieces. And I thought at this point you'd have to move other pieces next. Yeah, this night drop really surprised me, but it's fascinating. I do wonder, at some point, does building a structure like the duck leg castle around the king become an appropriate idea? I don't think it's the right balance between attack and defense in this situation. But I am curious. Because, like, it, the opponent looks like they're targeting toward 5-7 very heavily. So if you could just reinforce the 5-7 point a lot, and tuck the king between a castle or two and play, like, the duck leg strategy, how impressive would that be here? I wonder but it's probably overly defensive and misses out on some attacking chances. Whereas like this night drop seems to really seize the moment. All right, so we see move 4-4, four, four, something, 3-7, something, and then they 2-something, move, something, and then 1-3, etc. Okay, the 44th move, knight 3-6, this move is good. But it would be even better to attack from using pawn... Uh, one three and pawn one two. Interesting. Um. Oh. Oh wow! I seem to have vastly 
underestimated that attacking potential. Yeah, so your pawns can, like, do a tremendous amount of damage, and your king is comparatively safe here. That I've not evaluated, but now that I look more at it, yeah. Um, hmm. Going for the silver is a good move. Yeah. But... Uh, there's more than one way to go for a silver here. So it's not a bad move. It is a good move. But uh, Pawn 1-3, etc. would be very powerful here. Interesting. So while I kept obsessing over like a pawn 2-5, I attacked it there, but it just wasn't meant to be. And now we get closer to the end game. There were many good moves after this. Uh, move 54, 7 4 pawn is a very good move with a wide view of the board. Yes, that 7 4 pawn drop impressed me. Um, I was actually a bit surprised uh, the handicap giver took that pawn. As taking it looked quite dangerous. And leaving it there, I missed the danger element of it, but maybe it was super dangerous too. I don't know. Um, obviously, Handicap Giver is in a dire situation. They have to take desperate chances. Mm. But I was still surprised that the pawn went captured. Um... But maybe there was no choice. I mean, the game turned out well. So what am I saying? I don't know. So because they dropped the knight on 4 or 5 first, this bishop could retreat all the way back to 8-8. Um, and then re-emerge later some other way. Um... <laughs> so, yeah, it's challenging. Um, I remember the first tourney to Shodan. I think it was the first one. At some point, uh, I had an okay performance. The Llama Lord had a very, very good performance. And we got to play for the chance to, uh, for the winner of the tourney to Shodan, I believe. And he crushed me. So I recall like being in this uh, tourney to showdown situation where there's just so, so much to consider. Uh, the counterattack, 7-9 bishop, became severe uh, because he gave up the silver. Um...
All right, so it's been relayed to the pro what uh, the handicap receiver was thinking. And he has many remarks here. This is quite an active position. I see a four, a two. I don't know what much of this means, unfortunately. Yeah, it's quite generous of these pros to uh, be... I mean, yes, it's a job, and it's a great job uh, to be able to meet with folks around the world. It's uh, quite a privilege there. Um, uh, <laughs> Lily's got a question. It could well be the case. Yeah. Um. <laughs> It'll be exciting to see Lily's game later tonight. That'll be so exciting. So again, this match was scheduled. Um at times that the players and the pros could meet together. Unfortunately, that means I'm the best commentary you're going to get tonight. We'll endure, or we'll, we'll have fun uh, watching these games together and hopefully be able to put up with my voice for a bit. Um, oh, I see. Yes, there's an expression of gratitude as that last statement, if I'm reading it right. Uh, maybe I'm not. That looks like arigato, etc. Um, yeah, so it's very kind and generous. Four pieces down is graduation. And two pieces down is next. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Alright, cool. So a uh, two-piece handicap will be played by the next person in line. Let me double check my schedule here. Um, so Synchro was playing first. Foradun will be playing at the beginning of the next hour, unless they've already started. <laughs> All right. Um, let's take a look. Let's reset my interface and reset the board dimension and when the game begins we'll be ready to spectate it yeah i'm very glad uh, that this opportunity is available um, I'm not compensated in any way, nor do I deserve to be for this service of us just enjoying the games together. I'm not a pro. I'm just an amateur who enjoys the game, enjoys our international community learning it together, and find it a bit miraculous uh, that pros are available to play these handicap matches and help teach the world together. So, we'll see the game announcement down here, but I keep hitting the refresh button in the toolbar anyway, because I'm just a bit anxious. So, yeah. Um, we'll be making a video from this. I'm sure people, hopefully folks in the video, or myself many years hence, might provide some translation of what the pro was saying. It's quite possible that because I've recorded the video, um, we might be able to... Uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I was a bit foolish in closing that chat window a bit quickly. But 
if there are any particular moments we need translated, I'm sure we can find someone who can help us. Good luck to both players. This is a two-piece handicap game. Our handicap receiver, I believe, won the Tourney to Shodan tournament. And we see they now have a ranking of one Don. Um, I'd confused myself. There's three tournaments that Shogi Harbor, the community, and the tournament organizer put together. The first of the three um, has a rather fun name. Tourney to Josu. As in, oh, you play so good. Um, it's said in a way to try to encourage people. Um, and it's it's cute. So I think that normally is people that are ranked below 5Q. Um, so we saw in our previous game, sorry, my memory fails me, Synchro had won that tournament and uh, elected to play a four-piece handicap. Here we have Foradun, uh, the winner of the tourney to Shodan. Uh, again, they... Uh, the prize is a handicap game, and I believe some kind of certificate. I don't recall. Um, but yeah, this handicap game with a pro, it's an awesome experience. I would be scared to death. I'd need a lot of practice, and uh, that's just me. Maybe that's just me being a bit crazy. But yeah, there's many strategies you could try in a handicap game. You could play it like a normal game. You could play some sort of unique strategy. So we saw in a four-piece handicap that this climbing gold on the right side of the board was actually tremendously effective. Here, yeah, um, our handicap receiver tries to very quickly activate their rook and bishop. So, to that end, yeah, pushing the Rook Pawn has advantages that you can get the Pawn in hand, clear away from the Rook, or for the Rook, and make room for your other pieces to invade. So these are the advantages of pushing the Rook Pawn. Or rather, the last part is make room for your other pieces. Instead of having the Pawn blocking the way. All right. Against this advancing silver, we see a castle being set up in the center of the board. Makes sense. I mean, if you were to build a castle on the left side or on the right side, then the other wing would become vulnerable immediately. Two-piece handicap is large. So, yeah. Um, there we go. And I'm trying to recall, I don't remember what openings um, our handicap receiver normally plays. And whether like this pawn 4-6, silver 4-7 is something that's part of their typical affair. Maybe it is. I'm not, I don't recall. Um, That's interesting. This pawn advanced to 3, 6. Every pawn you advance, every time you push a pawn, that takes a move. Every move you spend is a move you could be doing something else with. So any one individual pawn move is probably fine. Um, I mean... How can one criticize, right? You do need to make moves to win the game. And part of that is attacking, and part of that is defending. And if you have this large material advantage, um, overly defending is not profitable. But if you attack in a way that's not flexible, it gets difficult later to both attack and defend at the same time. Of course, um, 
pros have played many games, both even and handicap games, and they are well aware of uh, strategies that can uh, both player both sides of a situation can play. So here, yeah, they're fighting against any kind of advance on files two or three by putting their generals side by side like that. They're preventing a breakthrough. Uh, a potential downside of putting your generals on like 3-2 and 2-2 like that is that um, if the gold on 3-2 is ever removed, it becomes a very fragile shape. But uh, there is some immediate strength in putting your pieces like this and doubling them. Um, so it, it deals with some quick attacks by the pawns and the knight that normally I'm not accustomed to seeing here. So our handicap receiver tries to activate their pieces through another path. It's not easy. Both sides of this game have a difficult situation. But unlike last game, here we we don't have a pre-baked plan or having to invent one. And that's a tough situation. Last game, they were able to execute this climbing gold that um, it's specific to handicap play. Um, it took me a while to recall that we've seen games like that before. This I don't happen to recall. All right, yeah. Advancing the pawn in front of the rook forces the opponent to drop their pawn. Maybe forces is the wrong word, but if or when the rook retreats, then there'd be a pawn 2-4 threat. So, yeah, this is entirely reasonable. And so now Santa has a pawn in hand. A pawn in hand can do tremendous damage. Um, yeah. So... Uh, oh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah, so if this king had moved one step early, well, that's a false equivalence. Yeah, there was not an, an opportunity to just easily break in earlier. One can dream and wish and hope but there's not an easy path. Um, all right, so, okay, we've built a castle, sure. Interesting. The pawn on 6-5 does limit the scope of the knight on 7-3. Um, but the knight and silver and gold together with the pawns make it very difficult for a handicap receiver to attack. Um, I am idly curious. Is there something so wrong with bishop 7-7? Seven, seven? Um, okay, yeah, there's no need to hurry and play it right away. And this does prepare an eventual attack on the head of the bishop. So that, I'm not sure whether it was silver advance or gold advance to 6-4 makes more sense, but yeah, that does prepare an attack.
Um, Oh, I'd be nervous about that one. It's what I'd want to play, but also I'd be nervous about pushing pawn 6-6 six, six here. It is what I want to play. Yeah, I'd be nervous about this one too. I still haven't found a perfect move. In reality, perfect moves just don't seem to exist very much. Uh, Well, actually this is quite good. Yeah, that seems very good. It forces the king to be used as a defensive piece. Um, invention is hard. I'm impressed. Yeah, this is the test. Sooner or later, that would have had to have been played anyway. Um, this, I don't know what you do. This pawn move catches me very much by surprise. Oh. Um, I'm reasoning through a lot of things. I don't think this pawn move works. But maybe the position was quite desperate already. I was expecting pawn 7-5. But I guess that doesn't work either. Pawn 7-5 something and then pawn 6-5 dropping the only pawn in a hope to like try to protect the king a little bit longer. But no, it is necessary to show some aggression in order to win. So here's our aggression is pushing this pawn. Um, potential downside of it is that like say the bishop advances and say maybe we move a knight to 7-7, seven, seven, drop a pawn at 6-5. You know, it, it gets... Well, if the bishop advances, maybe the bishop gets trapped. But I don't see how. Well, if knight 7-7, seven, seven, then potentially the bishop gets trapped. Okay. Okay, so that's the nuance here. Interesting. Um... Also, I'm forgetting that this pawn on file 9 might be able to advance quickly. Mm. Huh. So, candidate moves seem to be pawn 9-5. Bishop eight four maybe. Um, I'm looking for other candidates. I'm not coming up with any others. Maybe no. The silver five six would be much too dangerous, right? Yeah, that'd be reckless. Um, I'm starting to look at pawn 7-5. No, pawn 7-5 doesn't break through. It would be cool if it did.
<laughs> if the bishop advances, the king might move toward the bishop. Um, uh, this game, Shogi, is so complex. Just check that my mic is set up. It is good. So, yeah. Not sure what the perfect moment to push pawn 9-5 is, but this looks like a moment. Um, I mean, of course, no. Yeah. I guess pawn nine five, gold six five, bishop eight four. It might get violent. Oh, uh, they dropped their only pawn. Interesting. I didn't think this would happen. Um, oh. All right, this is a calm way to play this position. I forgot this way existed. So. Uh, yeah. Potentially you could just, if you drop a pawn on 9-4. Um, well, it's the same deal. That doesn't. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so I guess you take this pawn. They might drop a pawn, say on nine three. Hmm. So, yeah, I'm not seeing any perfect breakthrough. Yes, yeah, so this is the move I'd be tempted to play. Just because I'm not seeing a better way to try to break through. And then I would assume, maybe incorrectly, that Lance takes his best. And then the only thing that can stop the bishop... Oh, never mind. I am mistaken. But wait, isn't there a lance 9-4? Well, then the lance ends up on 9-1. Huh. Actually, wait. Yeah, so Lance 9-4, King 8-3, Lance promotes on 9-3. That looks really rough for the handicap giver. Um... Well, maybe there's some tactics where it would justify using a pawn rather than a lance. Um, there's a lot of combinations here. But 
But yeah, Lance 9-4 seems to launch an attack that I don't see any way to stop. Pawn 9-4, I'm not sure. Maybe it also does the same thing. Pawn 9-4, Lance 9-1. Nine, Lance 9-3, nine, Pawn 9-2. Lance takes, Lance takes. Yeah, no. I think you, you have to start with the Lance. We'll find out soon. So, I don't know. After you break in on the edge file, then what? Alright, but here I thought... Lance 9 1 was available, but maybe it's not the right way. I don't know. It looks. Lance 9 1 looks very possible. Yeah. <sighs> Unless I've missed something. What else could there be in this position? I mean, there might be some super aggressive attacking options somewhere else. I'm looking. If the opponent heavily commits to stopping the uh, attack on the left side of the board, maybe the lance could be of use elsewhere. But I don't know about that either. Lance 9 1, bishop 8 4, king 8 3. There's. I don't see a convincing continuation there. Lance 9 1, lance 9 9. Lance takes pawn, bishop takes knight, king takes bishop, lance takes lance. Is not even promotion. Hmm. I mean, last turn I was also looking at a pawn drop on 9-3 instead of 9-4, but oh yeah, I guess Lance 9-4 hits that really hard. Never mind. So, oh. Wow. Okay. That shows the flexibility of mind that comes with being a pro. While I would look to try to completely shut down this attack, they look for something that slows down the attack by just enough while allowing them to attack elsewhere. That's amazing. Um... So, oh, sorry, they moved the knight. Maybe that is best. That's aggressive. But maybe it's best. I was starting to look at things like, well, could we just drop a lance on 8-4? Mm, I'm not sure. Okay, this shuts out the bishop.
Hmm. Yeah, that's a really clever defensive move, this silver retreat. これより秒読みに入ります。10秒 Oh no. Oh no. That's most unfortunate. But so are the rules of this game. Let's see what is said and what is done. Hmm. That's most unfortunate. Imagine preparing hard for this match, giving it your all, and then uh, momentarily having a lapse in reason. We're all human. We all learn together. I mean, I think at this point, though, like, we had seen so many things that this game had to offer already. We've seen this wonderful exchange of ideas. Um, and we're starting to see things trend in, in a direction where it doesn't feel like the handicap receiver is in control of the play. It feels like the initiative has shifted at this point. Even if this pawn drop were legal, I'm not sure that it helps the bishop activate or anything like this. Um, that's really rough. So our handicap giver has a question. I'm doing the best I can to try to understand this question. Um, I see the first syllable of each of those is to, um, but I don't know. I think that L shape is she, so he's probably referring to to something takes something takes and asking about what do you think about this? Um, if I had to guess, but I do not know. Um, uh, yeah, so they're asking about, uh, game review. Uh, translation's catching up a bit. It's, English is a challenging language. Japanese is a challenging language. Translation services between English and Japanese are extraordinary and amazing. And I could never badmouth a translator given the difficulty of both languages. Um, so it's difficult to translate, not just because of the literal how you read each language, but each of the connotations and idioms and things like that that are present that make each language unique. Um, let's see. So for Dune, we have Ms. Mention, would you like to review the game so far? 
and this message is relayed to the pro. Let's see after the pro comments. We'll see how it is translated. All right, let's take a look at some of the game. Yes, up to this point, I mean, sure, I don't really know this pawn. I don't play Static Rook, so I'm not super familiar with this Joseki in the first place. As for whether the silver is supposed to be um, 3-7 or 4-7 or wherever, um, but it seems like one pawn moved too many, but uh, many things might be possible and even good in handicap play. I would try to balance. I don't know where the king's going to end up. They have a lot of options here. But it just something about this shape is so unfamiliar to me. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is not the most common pattern ever. But it is a very good beginning. Uh, for my mistake, I was being mindful of pieces and pulled your king away from the defense formed on the second file. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah. Um... Yeah, th there are many things that are positive about this opening, even though it's not a regular pattern that I've seen before. The rook is active, the bishop is active. They're claiming space uh, on the right side toward the center. There's many ways to defend the king. They've not severely limited their options. This is still a reasonable way to begin the beginning of the game. Okay, so the translator is translated to the pro uh, for Dun's comment. Yeah, um... Yes, yeah, so they are doing many things right. Like I point out, the rook, the bishop, and silver are all active. There's multiple ways to securely defend the king. Although I'm not clear which way they're ultimately going to go with that. Um, now I chuckle a little bit because I'd watch... I don't know, I find it amusing watching particular opening strategies on YouTube. And one of them in particular seems quite amusing, but might uh, not be the best strategy. This rook move was actually quite interesting. Because the king can now use the right side of the board as a castle. And the rook could potentially become active on the left side of the board. But this might also burn a tempo. And maybe the rook actually belongs on 9-9 nine, nine instead of 7-9. Yeah, so the coordination between um, these pieces is quite good. The silver 
on 4-7 coordinates with wolf golds. A silver on 6-8, it's not in anyone's way. It's a flexible position. He hasn't made any grave error. So yeah, this is a respectable, good position. You notice I'm maybe hedging my words a little bit. Um, because even though there's not any outright flaw here, it's... I don't know how it is that they're going to proceed from this position. It seems difficult to continue while uh, the handicap uh, giver keeps claiming more territory. There's not any one clear way to break through. Um, but yeah, there's no overt error here. The pieces are coordinating beautifully. This rook transition is clever. It doesn't seem to immediately profit, and that's what... It, I mean, it does give uh, the handicap giver a lot to think about. They've got to accurately defend the left side of the board all of a sudden. Whereas previously the attack was more focused on the right side of the board. So this might be the perfect moment to do this work transition. I just don't know how to play it. It's my problem. Um, conversely, maybe something like pawn h6, even though it looks crazy. I don't know. It feels like there's got to be something, right? I just don't know like how to play this position. And the rook transfer looks perfectly reasonable, but also the rook looked fine on 2-9. Ah. Uh, I think part of this is also going to be learning how to ask the best questions. And how to make the most of the time it's really quite difficult, especially after playing such an emotional game, or such a challenging game, rather. Um, and sure, there are things you'd love to ask about. And perhaps after the first time you've played a handicap game, or after so many times playing a handicap game, you learn like what sorts of questions you find most satisfying to ask. Um, in addition to the options that are already available in the interface itself. And perhaps this is something in our community we could learn to do better, too. Let's learn like how to ask about particular sequences and moves um, and learn a notation together that we all understand. I think, in particular, move numbers seem to come across, uh, seem to not get stuck across language barriers. So, if you mention move numbers and pieces and squares, these tend to um, be unambiguous. Although it's quite difficult when you're confused about what the idea should be. Like, how specific do you get in your question? I don't know. Um, I thought the edge file to Suji were quite interesting, to be honest. It's a good procedure to have the land taken the lance and attacked. But before that, one point of advice. 
Let's see, this is a, actually a really subtle, nuanced translation, I think. Look at that compound sentence there. I'm impressed. Both, um, I assume, by the Japanese as well as by the translation. Imagine being... I mean, many English speakers struggle to communicate in such a compound uh, manner and be unambiguous and clear in their speech. Um, imagine doing that twice and yeah, once in Japanese, once in English and not losing anything in between. And then having to write things one way so it can be communicated clearly across the translation, even if you don't know the other language seems hard but i'm sure they have some experience with the sort of thing they're all pros they're very good now the situation at move 39 pawn 85 the 95 pawn is a sharp move but there is also silver 67 you know i thought about this i wondered silver 67 seems incredibly flexible but what does it do? It takes some space. It finds harmony with the other pieces. It protects against future whatever. We don't even know what the future might hold at this point. It seems extremely flexible. And I and myself had almost suggested it during the commentary. I had ample time. I was just so confused by it because like yeah i wanted to see it just to see what it would do um the pawns and the silvers you hear in chess that the pole the pawn is the soul of chess and shogi i think territory is claimed by pawns and silvers working together very frequently. I think really the pawn and the silver together seem to be a very large part of this game of shogi. Um, so there must be great significance to this silver 6-7 idea. The next move, pawn 6-5, 8-8-bishop, 5-6 silver, or 5-6 silver right, to 6-9 rook. Oh, you could vacate the 6th file, make use of it with the rook, then advance your pawn to 4-5, and the other silver to 4-6. Yeah, so we're taking a look at this. And they do encourage you... It might feel childish, but they do encourage you to play the moves to make sure you understand it. Um, but yeah, if in this event a pawn 6-5 does happen and the bishop gets kicked back, then you could make use of advancing both silvers and the pawn to 4-5, um, and silver 4-6 and the other knight to 7-7. Seven, seven. Um, the next 6-5 knight would not be accepted. Wow. Um, yeah, so he's pointing out that if you could pile on the 6-5 square repeatedly, then pawn 6-5 is not available. So yeah, this is a very clever way of slowly assembling pieces to prevent pawn 6-5 from being so effective. Yes, yeah, so this is potentially a way they could spend a move with, say, pawn 3-4. And yeah, potentially pawn 1-4 spends a move. What's impressive to me is that this, the idea of advancing this silver like this silver four six 
that's really smart. That is amazing. So this is how you can slowly coordinate your pieces. That is how you can collect a pawn peacefully. And he points out that then a knight capture on 6-5 would not be, he says, accepted. In English, we might say accepted or recaptured. But yeah, this is a very slow, powerful uh, thrust against the 6-5 square. And due to this variation or this kind of idea, um, pawn drop 6-5 might not be available in the first place. But it might be forced in the first place, too. This is very surprising and impressive to me. There are just so many pieces on this board, and it's difficult to keep track of them all. So seeing them attack in such beautiful harmony is... it's... I don't know what to call it. Maybe to stronger players this isn't quite so impressive, but to me, like, this is something I think uh, players on this site would struggle to come up with. Um, it's a great plan. It really is. I think players on the high side of 2 Don, maybe 3 Don, AD1 Dojo, maybe a high side of 2 Don, would be able to come up with this consistent idea. It's not easy. It's very patient. But boy, it's effective. And this is just the main variation of this idea. Um, there are many other ideas. There are many other variations to supplement this. So if they try to like play pawn 5-5, five five, you can see things spiral some other way. Exchanges happen some other way and, you know, some kind of treatise on how to play middle game uh, pawn ideas. It would be kind of interesting to read. I'm not sure any such literature exists, and probably in English it doesn't exist yet. Um, Yep, yeah, so that's the... oh, well, yes. Uh, timing that might be slightly off, but yes, you take here first. But yeah, the key concept is that 6-5 drops. There's no way to hold the 6-5 point. And since um, the handicap giver does not have a pawn in hand, there's not immediately a way to attack this bishop either. Although if there were a pawn in hand, yeah, then this pawn 8-6 idea would be of profound concern. So probably there's some variation somewhere where they would find a way to get a pawn and try to make this complicated. But the pure idea here... Um, the simplest line where it just, both players just try to maintain their space. Um, like, this is beautiful.
Yeah, so each game and post-game analysis combined seem to fit within an hour. Um, uh, many things seem to fit within an hour and are done on a regular schedule. The fact that this game concluded in under 40 minutes potentially means like there's plenty of time to ask and answer questions. Um, I'm actually finding this section just as exciting as the gameplay. So I can't help but wonder, um, like it'd be great. <laughs> oh dear, I can't ask too much. But this is just incredible. Um, what an opportunity. Yeah, having a pro helping you analyze your game for a half hour is amazing. You can ask so many questions. If not for tradition, you know, um, <laughs> there's a tradition of doing the post-game analysis right after the game. If not for tradition, it could be interesting to let players and such play their handicap game and come back in a, a little bit later and then do the half hour or something game analysis, but like it, it's probably not going to turn out that way ever but like yeah it feels so difficult to analyze a game in like 15 minutes or something and a half hour for analysis feels like you can ask so so many questions especially if you're prepared for it um so this has me wondering about um yeah the best part of this experience. I mean, yeah, the gameplay is great. Um, yeah, I was wondering about this. Welcome. Yeah, we're just spying on uh, handicap games that have been offered on behalf of uh, tournament winners. Or happen, are being offered two tournament winners on behalf of the Shogi Harbor community. Yes, after this there will be a third game. Uh, game number three will be Lily Lion Main versus Madoka Kitao. And truthfully, <laughs> I am very, very much anticipating that game to be played with Senta Handicap. So, I'm looking forward to it. Yep. So our dragon on 9-3 is still in play, so even though you've lost a piece, uh, even though you lost your bishop, you have a strong attack anyway, and there's so much for the opponent to consider here. But, but yeah, it's interesting. Yes. Yeah, it's... Lily, we've played on a few occasions, and she keeps improving. She's extremely good amateur player. Um, I'm always nervous. Uh, even though I put on a calm facade, we all know, like, yeah, I, I'm scared. <laughs> so, uh, seeing her play 
um, Madoka Kitao with Senta Handicap. Ugh. Yeah, I am super excited to see this. Yeah, I know. Well, I don't know. I haven't played a pro here before. I've not won one of these tournaments. Um, I knew I would be so excited in this kind of situation. Probably out of my mind. Just having so many questions and not being able to structure my thoughts together, etc. Um, so yeah, this dialogue exchange is um, it's quite deliberate. He's planning on trying the ninth vowel. Uh, yeah, he wasn't sure if this is enough. <laughs> yeah, you know, there are no certainties in life. There are no certainties in shogi other than checkmate. Uh, once the checkmate happens, then you know it's happened. Or once you can see the checkmate, then you know it's there. Um, but yeah, there's not... It's not a lot of certainties in Shogi. You do have to balance your risks and figure out which risks are worth balancing. Um, but probably, um, probably our pro has quite a bit of interesting stuff to respond in terms of how to think about this. I am curious. Ah, I was disappointed this time. But he felt competent enough. Let's play another game. I look forward to that opportunity. Thank you all very much. I see four doing slightly nervous here. They're all friendly. You can speak freely. Thank you for this great opportunity. I look forward to playing again someday. That's a bright spirit. Best of luck to everyone in the future. All right, I think, yep, my translator has left the room. There's no point in my attempting to translate, communicate, etc. further. Let's prepare for this. So, yeah, as soon as the game begins, I'll make some mention in the Discord that the game has started. And that way we all have a chance um, to watch this together. Yeah, we can see it's getting later and later where I am located. But we can't miss this. We cannot miss this. So, yeah, it will be quite exciting. I don't think I've seen um, an amateur play against a pro with Senta Handicap before. So, that's going to be something.
Right, I'm going to continue to refresh and we'll see the game as soon as it comes across the wire. I'm going to double check that I have the board set to large. I do. That's all well and good. So it's just a matter of when the players are able to get together, we can begin watching this together. I hope I have the hour of the match correct. If I don't, it's okay. Um, so yeah, in two handicap games, I'm sure players had many questions. I'm sure um, players will also be bringing those games to the Sunday game review live stream. The well, live stream is perhaps an interesting term for that, but a live interaction of dialogue after the game is concluded, but sure. We have Sunday Shogi, where we all bring our games. I've submitted a game record from when I was playing a teaching ladder a couple weeks ago. Due to IRL events, that game hasn't been able to be reviewed yet. So this Sunday Shogi would be the first time my tournament game from like two weeks ago will be able to be reviewed. It was a firestorm of a game. I look forward to seeing more about it. You think in the ISF forum, 2021, some games were sent to handicap. Oh, oh, we could check that out sometime too. That's awesome. So I mentioned, I hope I have the hour correct, but it's also possible maybe Maybe all the games aren't played on the same day. So I might not even have the date correct for this here. I hope I do. Because it'd be great to be able to watch it. Um, I'm going to take a look at some messages on Discord while we wait. Uh, so I'm looking at the Lee Shogi Discord. Hmm. So there's some questioning about some people want to see a Lee Shogi app. Other people are asking, well, why would you want to see a Lee Shogi app? What does a mobile app have to offer that a mobile browser does not offer? And yeah, I'm there's a lot that could be said in a lot of different ways about that. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to click that button. I want to hit this refresh button next to the wait for game button. We see uh, Fordon from Japan logged in, Gotanda. Uh, she's done a number of live streams over the months and years. Uh, she's logged in again. Um, yep, yeah, meanwhile, we all patiently and excitedly await. Um, hoping that we have the time of the game correct. Perhaps most interesting or concerning about this arrangement is that I think it's the Harbor community or helping coordinate the matches, but our Harbor Master um, lives in Europe at the moment and uh, might not be completely awake if there were any issue to occur, uh, she might not be immediately responsive to it. Oh, here we go. Somehow I missed this. I apologize. Let's take a look. From the top. So this is sent to Handicap. Uh, Lily Lion Main and Madoka Kitao. So our Handicap receiver moves first. 
and displaying a static rook opening. Okay, yeah, this is Crab Castle. We've seen this before. Uh, over here, let me take a look at this again. Oh, is this Crab Castle versus Crab Castle? But this is a little more flexible. I think I've seen Telmarch do something like, or he's done like silver up gold here, something like that. Um, but okay, it seems flexible. And that takes us to our current position. Now in handicap games, even though you could call the pieces black and white, you don't. We still call them a handicap receiver and handicap giver, unless it's an even game. So this is sent a handicap. This is an ambitious handicap for sure. Taking on a ladies pro, Madoka Kitao. Very famous uh, with the Lady Professional Shogi Association. Very, um, so. I apologize for my own ignorance. Uh, but I believe Madoka has helped in many, many, many ways in that organization. I'm going to do my due diligence and research at this point because it's somewhat embarrassing that I don't know more about this. So, yeah, she is ranked uh, Tudan, uh, Kita Maruka, um, and so she's helped immensely with business, uh, shogi-related business and promotion activities. Um, she created the game Dubutsu Shogi, which you can find on this website and on other websites. And you can even find the board game. Um, so it's a simplified version of the game designed to help teach beginners. Um, and to, let's see, in 2008, uh, she came up with the rules of the game, while Fujita designed the game's pieces. She is the representative and director and founder of Nekomado, a shogi promotion, education, and publishing company, from whom I have pub uh, purchased several books. Um, I greatly appreciate that. Um, yeah, that's... Um, she's also credited with discovering Karolina Stachinska, um, aka Shogi Harbor, um, while playing on the site 81 Dojo as part of her efforts for promoting Shogi outside of Japan among non-Japanese players. She was quite impressed with the strength of Stachinska's play, eventually found out who she was and made arrangements for Stachinska to come and practice shogi in Japan. Um, um, through this encouragement and support, um, we had the first non-Japanese player to be awarded any type of professional status by the JSA. So, yeah, it's thanks to Madoka that uh, Shogi Harbor has been able to take the game to another level with our international community um, as well show the world that uh, it is possible for non-Japanese players to become shogi pros. Um, so this is really quite extraordinary. All right, so back to our game. Yeah, so far, like I said, I, I don't play static rook opening strategy, so I'm a bit at sea looking at stuff like this. 
Um, if there were any visible fault, I would try to point it out at this time. I do not see any fault in this. So, uh, out of visual interest, let me load up a proverb. Just see what our next inspiring quote is. Use the silver like a plover. Plover is be one of those fancy words we learned by way of playing uh, OMG words. The crossword game. Um, plow is another kind of word that means something similar to plover, but plover has this connotation of moving in a zigzag fashion that a plow might not necessarily always have. It's a specific kind of plow. Um, anyway. So, yeah, here we see that the Handicap Giver has advanced upon to 8.5. Let me check the move list. Um, so that happened on move 16, the pawn 8.5. Here, hmm, yeah, we haven't, because the pawn's on 8.5, then I don't think we're going to see pawn 2.5 in response to it. Um, but yeah, here we can see this castle constructed in the center of the board. Um, all right, I apologize. I meant I said that I was going to mention something in the Discord server. So, yeah, this, uh, I believe this is shape is called snow roof. Um, in Japanese, they call it gangi, which is snow roof. Uh, and the idea, if you're trying to attack this shape, is you would love to remove the silver. And then the rest of this could collapse. But boy, it is so hard to remove the silver. It takes a really compelling attack to remove it. I am impressed, however. Like this pawn 8-5, pawn 7-4, this is ambitious. So our handicap giver is attacking. It's a very active style of play. So note that um, in many positions it's necessary for the static rook player to play pawn 9-4 to prevent a bishop from invading, but here it's not yet necessary to do that. It might become necessary, say, if the silver were to move from 6-2 and if a knight were to go to 7-3, then at some point you might need to push this pawn, but so far tactics don't require it. Um, Lily, I assume, is, or Handicap Receiver, I assume, is trying to figure out which castle to build and where best to build it. Not an easy task. So at some point, um, Handicap Giver must have done something that removed our handicapped receiver from her prep. All right, so pawn 2-5 does get played. Um, yeah, in some positions, this pawn 2-5 can be 
not great on account of there being a piece on 3 3 that would be difficult to remove. Here, there's not yet a piece on 3 3 that would be difficult to remove. And here, we're also looking at potentially bishop 3 1. But now that pawn 2 5 is played, maybe we're not going to see bishop 3 1, but bishop 3 3 instead. Um, Oh, bishop 3 1 happens anyway. Oh boy. I would be biting my nails at this point. So we have three pieces attacking the 8 6 square the rook on 8 2, the bishop on 3 1, and the pawn on 8 5. Now also, we have a silver on 6-8. The silver is not on 7-7, seven, seven, it's on 6-8. Which means we have only two pieces defending uh, the 8-6 square. It also means that trying to defend on file 8 will be very difficult. I think the point of playing pawn 2-5 was to assert that there's a strong attack incoming on the right side of the board. Um, so, oh, rook takes is my kind of move, um, which is why I'm so nervous about it. Um, hmm. Goodness. Um, oh, wow. I didn't even consider this one. Well, I am dazzled. I had originally been thinking rook 2-5 instead of rook 2-6. Um, after rook 2-5, if knight 3-3, three, three, then the rook could drop back to 2-6, but then you might see pawn 2-4, pawn 2-5 at some point. But I don't know if there would ever be time to do such a thing. Anyway, all that subtlety is out the window at this point. The bishop's head is under fire. Um, that's not clear where the bishop's going to go. I'm impressed, though. So, potentially after pawn takes pawn, I don't know whether silver 7-3 or something else would be best or most effective. Yeah, so you have to protect the bishop's head at least for this turn. But now what? This is where we enter a maze. Um, might be difficult to get out of this maze. Um, in theory, well, if somehow you could break open the diagonal, that could be interesting. Um... Uh, that has me nervous. Wow. Okay, so the rook is not going to float over to 7-5, unfortunately. Um, yeah. The pawn on 6-6 six, six is supported by a bishop. Um, tactics might warrant that you have to support the pawn another time. Maybe. Oh boy. Because after this retreat, um, what was I just looking at? I think I was looking at, oh, 
What I was looking at might not be possible. I was managing a pawn dropping at 7-6, another pawn moving to 8-6, and the rook swinging from 8-6 to 6-6, but um, there'd be a pawn on 7-6 in that case. So tactics might justify this. This position might be okay. At some point, we might expect to see pawn 2-2. Two, two. Um, just to force gold takes and give our handicap receiver more time to plot an attack. But dropping a pawn might also be one pawn too heavy. So your handicap givers looking for whether it's best to maybe move up. That is quite flexible and reasonable. Uh, yeah, I don't see any weakness to this, at least not immediately. Um, unfortunately for handicap receiver, bishop on 7-7, seven, seven, it's going to have some difficulty entering the game to good effect. Um, I'm a bit perplexed. So I would imagine that like defending the 7-6 square is important. Defending the king is important. And therefore, like... Maybe there's a way to transition from Crab Castle to Snow Roof. Not that I'm super familiar with either of these strategies. Um, but yeah, here we have a split, a fork in the road. Where you either got to choose, are we going to double down on this attacking idea? Um trying to break in on the longest diagonal or are we somehow going to find another way even if it's a difficult way i don't know how like the minute you start moving the pieces in front of the king it becomes a very tense moment um So, potentially, I guess I, what I would, you know, the castle in front of the king's fine. Crab castle's okay. Um, potentially pawn 2-4, and then pawn 3-5 might be of some interest. I don't know. Some way to clear a path for the silver on 4-6. But, as soon as it moves, then the rook on 2-8's hanging. This is a tough position. I shouldn't be giving specific variations because many of them aren't right. Um, hmm. Double check my overlay. Everything's set up right. Good. Yeah, this is a tough position. You'll note that there is a beautiful harmony in the handicap giver's pieces. Such an efficiency and flexibility and like everything's defended 
gosh, playing like a pro is something to aspire to. It's such a hard thing to emulate playing like a pro. Even more interesting is that, or just as interesting as this pawn to 8 5 advancement, despite offering the handicap of a turn, it's an ambitious move. Um, not being willing to be put on defense right out of the gate. Yeah, but at this point, one starts to have feelings about pawn 6-6. Six, six. There, there is a strategy and a plan behind it. It's just... Oh, it's complex. Um, like, if one were to try on the right side of the board to emulate what's being done on the left side of the board, you're always going to be one move behind. That's so rough. This is being played at the 32nd Yoyomi. That will keep the game going quite quickly. Alright, so this is the moment we've been building up to. These are the fireworks we've all been awaiting. So yeah, I'd seen that if I if you play pawn six five, the pawn in six five is really hard to support and hangs quite quickly, even though it does vacate the diagonal for this bishop. Here if you play pawn five five first and then pawn six five, you might actually have a really nice attack. Um you might. If the bishop can make it to 5-5 and you have a pawn on 6-5, then you can consider a pawn drop 7-4 next. That said, um, yep, these are the fireworks we've been waiting for. I assume we're going to see pawn 6-5 next. There it is. Um, it's of some note that at some point in this combination like when the bishop's not about to be evicted from the diagonal. So maybe next turn. Well, I'm not going to say it until the opportunity's passed. I'm not going to give advice on a live game.
It takes guts to play moves so quickly. Yeah, I'm quite astonished by the way this game is proceeding. Wow. Um, this is going to be interesting. I'm on the front edge of my seat. Ah, so note that the rook on 8-2 is defended. So my sacrifice idea on doesn't seem so great. Okay, yeah, this, this finally enters back into play. That's good. So this attempts to deflect one of the two pillars upon which this castle rests. Um, all right, that pillar has been removed. Um, Hmm. Well, I'm quite confused here. That's not the move that confused me. Um, I wondered whether some crazy sacrifice... Hmm. Mm. No, it's too crazy. I found a defense. Never mind. Holy crap. Uh, the rook is not defended. This is an interesting moment. Well, yeah, there's that fork. It's not so concerned. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. The people's move. I don't know if this is a good move, but boy, is it exciting. That silver on 4-3, like, the two golds and the silver are pillars that hold up this castle. If you start removing any of them, there's not a castle anymore. Um, or rather, if you could remove any two of them, or if you could remove the silver on the head, then there's not a castle. Um, 
So this will be interesting. Handicap giver takes a minute to think. I have my suspicions, but I can't say anything. I guess what I can say is that well, this pawn drop 2-2, two, two, this series of sacrifices to open the center, and then ultimately the silver 4-4, four, four. what I can say is I'm proud of Lily's attacking style here. Alright, so the horse is what's going to hold this castle together instead of a silver. The horse is easier to attack, and that any piece that attacks it is not worth the same as the horse. Um, in most cases. But, uh, there's a number of differences between the player's positions here. So, interesting. That does sidestep a fork. Um... And it does activate the rook. I'm not sure that the fork was necessarily the handicap giver's strongest threat in the position. But this is a stable way to continue. And stability is valued when your time is short. Oh. A uh, thought just occurred to me. Mm -hmm. A thought just occurred to me. Mm -hmm. No, this rook advancement, that's one of many ideas in this position. Oh, this is interesting. Huh. I don't get it.
20秒1 2 3 4 5 I guess it's flexible. Yeah. Oh boy. So, yeah, I mean, at some point, the handicap receiver had to find some way to advance here. Um,. There's a great many things in this position that leave me confused. Um, well, actually, the uh, tactics seem to bear out this move. At least until what I assume the next move is going to be. I wonder if I can accurately predict. My next move guess would be pawn drop. You can either take my word or not, I guess, as to where this pawn might drop. But I have two squares in particular that I'd expect. And I'll explain why in a second. And again, a pawn drop might be a loss of a turn that maybe shouldn't be afforded here. Also, there's no reward in the game for playing your moves hastily. So, it behooves you to use your... T oh! Alright, so I was thinking either pawn drop 5-3 or 4-4. Trying to really solidify this position around the handicap givers king. This is more ambitious. That wasn't on my radar. That is dangerous. Um, maybe the idea here is to try to do something similar to the strategy mentioned in the previous game where you argue that this pawn on 5-6 is overextended and vulnerable and prone to capture. Maybe that's the idea. Maybe if that's the idea, the next idea would be, well, it'd be great to capture that with and be able to use the rook on this file. But that's too much to ask here. Oh, wow. We're pulling out all the stops here. Right. Um, this protects the silver's head, which reinforces the castle in the center of the board. Yes, this is merited aggression. Yeah, we saw a mouse click there that was on the wrong piece accidentally, but it was corrected very quickly. So, this aggression was planned. Um, target is clear. Calmly reducing one's ambitions. So, yeah, I'm impressed. Our handicap givers played so patiently here. I would have done many crazy attacking ideas by this point. All right, so you have a wedge on 7 7. 
Okay, yeah, that's necessary to take back this way. Both players are now in Byoyomi, meaning each player has 30 seconds per move. Both players are quite excited about the current position, so some moves might happen faster than 30 seconds per move. Um, oh boy. Uh, shoot. So now my attacking ideas. Yeah, yeah, this, this might be best. In other positions, maybe pawn 6-5 might not have been suicidal. Um, maybe. Here... No, I don't know that that capture works here. I don't think you want to give up the rook. Um, I don't know that you want to give up the rook here. Am I missing something? No, that's not it. Okay. Yeah, so this is an enduring attack. The silver on 6 4 is well placed. The longer it sits there, the better it looks. Both players pace themselves as we enter the end game. All right, so our handicap giver has two pieces in hand at this point. The pawn on seven six blocks the horse. Yeah, Blake notes that if you have uh, five or six moves to spare, maybe run away. You might have to run away at some point very soon here. Ah, that's a fast attacking move. Hmm. Yeah, running starting to sound pretty good right now, but it doesn't last. Yep, um, yep, so the running is forced. Oh. Oh, wow. I missed that. Good game. Well played. Let's take a look at post-game commentary together.
Yeah, that was intense. So, good to enjoy our post-game analysis and translation. Yep, so there's our familiar saying, Arigato. Thank you to the game. Thank you also to the audience for watching the game. Well said by our Shogi international promoter, Madoka Kitao. Uh, he was well aware of what's going on. Uh, having gone on many journeys to help promote the game. and being an international promoter and organizer. Um, you frequently see pictures of her at many events. So, yeah. All right. Um, the first 2-6 pawn was unexpected. Oh, interesting. Okay, so yeah, pawn 2-6 might have been too early and not congruent with the rest of the strategy here. Um, maybe. I don't know. I'm not at the same level that these players are at. So I'm not totally sure what this means. I'm sure we'll hear soon. Okay. Let's see. It's wonderful to be point uh to be able to point out various forms of battle. That's so cute too. Uh <laughs> uh it's so encouraging. Well I hope so anyway. Oh, so, yeah, this is a very tense moment. I, goodness, I would struggle to come up with a good move here. Um, I was surprised to see the rook on 2-6 instead of 2-5 in the first place, but putting the rook on 2-5 allows knight 3-3 three, three with tempo, which maybe knight 3-3 three, three might be good or bad depending on other circumstances, but... It gains a move toward attacking um, the handicap receiver's king, so. Rook 2 6, uh, I don't know. Um, on the other hand, on 2 6, a silver can't easily assail it. Saw the shape in some modern games. I think it could have played better in this case. The timing of some of them was felt incorrect. There's Kitao comments. I thought it would be Agra, the fortress shape. But the early 3-6 pawn, 3-7 silver was a modern shape, and this ended up um, being a snow roof castle. So, yeah. Although, arguably, well, anyway, 
What do I know? Yeah. So, there were many, um, some confluence of old and new ideas here. It's, <laughs> yeah. Timing everything perfectly against a pro would be extraordinary and awesome and quite difficult to achieve, so expect to be thrown off your balance a bit. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Rook 2-8 loses the tempo. But, yeah, this attack in the center looks... Mm, it looked really convincing. Pawn 2-2 two two I liked quite a bit. The silver 4-4 four four looked fun. Um, in, retros no, in retrospect, it still looks good. This is resourceful. Here we went for the shape two six rook. That's commenting an earlier position. Hmm. So we see two more comments after two six, but here he went for the shape of two six rook, which somebody oh yeah, Kita is pointing out this tactic here. So there's not ample time to just do whatever you want, as bishop 5-3 is actually quite resourceful and exploits the fact that um, the handicapped receiver blocked their own bishop in order to stop various tactics. Coordinating all of your pieces beautifully and in harmony is such a difficult task. Um, their handicap receiver did a, a very good effort at this, but lost uh, the initiative. Yeah, I felt it was a little easier to play the handicap giver's side at this point, since the bishop 5-3 yeah, makes this a strong threat of pawn 4-5, which has to be answered. Mm -hmm. I agree. I played the floating rook when I did. I was worried about bishop drops on 3 9. Uh, but yeah, after words had recognized that such fear, or the floating rook rather, was unnecessary. I see, so that was the reason for rook 2 6. If the player runs away from the rook, they've lost a move. So it would have been better to pull back to the lower rank in front of the rook. The player runs away from the rook, she has lost a move. So it would have been better to pull back to the lower rank in front of the rook. Uh, I can parse that a few ways, but... Um, compound sentences are quite challenging to read and to write. That could just be my misparsing it. Yeah, so this is a threat.
I think this is what both players are remarking on in their own way. But here this blocks both players' bishops, but then this exchange is possible. And then if bishops happen to exchange here, then bishop 3-9 is the threat. Um... Ah, interesting. Yeah, so handicap giver agrees. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering how to prevent this bishop three nine idea. It doesn't seem easy to prevent. Hmm. So, yeah, I was impressed by this tactic um, that tries to keep this game still a fighting game. But it's already a challenging position owing to the player's respective castle strengths and initiatives um, and peace activity. I thought this one was easier to point to. The 4-4 four, four silver is a winning move. Often when I've seen this point to, this has also been interchangeable with the phrase or the verb to play. So... Yeah, thought this one's easier to play. The silver 4 4 is a winning move. I was impressed by silver 4 4, but maybe I'm alone in that stance? Hmm. I mean, like, sure, there's potentially a different move. If you were to drop a bishop on, say, 6-6 six, six, instead of taking on 4-4 four, four directly, maybe? Not long ago, I would have been in the form of an 8-4 rook to be accepted or captured, so I was in a blind spot. I wondered how to deal with that. I apologize that I'm struggling a little bit to keep up with some of this.
Hmm. Would have been in the form of an 8 4 work to be accepted or captured, so I was in a blind spot and wondered how to deal with it. I don't know. I'm not sure. I did like the 8 1 Rick drop, although it did not prevail here. This is a nice sequence at the end. I assume she's asking, do you have any more concerns, thoughts, ideas, etc.? I don't know. But I assume this because I see a question mark and the player's name. Um, finally, the horse promoted piece, Uma, was very powerful, both offensively and defensively. Yeah, I was stunned just how effective that was. Like a hot knife through butter is amazing. I felt like my mistake was the start of the end game. Is that correct? I feel like already I was a small disadvantage, but I made it worse with unnecessary moves. Hmm. Yep. So this is a question between uh, the pro and uh, the player. It's not a question for me. I'm not going to barge into this conversation. Because if I do, everybody jumps in. And that's get, that gets difficult. So... It was very exciting. Yeah, Pawn 2-2 two two is beautiful. I like the Silver 4-4 four four idea. This is still a tough position. Extremely tough position. So, yeah, you're asking... I don't know. It's hard. Um, like, where does the Rook belong? It's very difficult to find the same skill and beauty and harmony that um, pros who uh, base their careers on finding good moves. It's difficult to keep up with what the pros do. Um, so there might not be an easy answer to the question. Um, but depending on what the question is, there might be good answers. I don't know. It's hard. Um, yeah, like this is a tough position. Depending on the specifics, the rook might go to various places. Um, but yeah, around here, this position I think already favors the handicap giver. In retrospect, far much the far much more than I thought it did during the game. During the game, I was getting quite excited and thinking um, anything could happen, but um, looking back at this now, this position looks quite difficult for a handicap receiver. <laughs> you would be correct. Yes. Carol has been playing many years and has a professional one done ranking
I think it was hard for her to not be able to use the Rook anymore. Yeah. And this idea of 2 4 pawn, 2 5 pawn, and 2 4 pawn. There was no time for it. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that works out. Pros play super efficiently. Yeah. That's really amazing. That your best laid ideas only start to take fruition and bam, it's it's over. That's so tough. But this is I guess it makes the games um experiences you can learn from. Yeah, once you're four down on wars, you can start to fight versus pros like Moronaka is equals. Yeah, as an attention split between commenting the game and playing it. So you can start. Mm -hmm. it became harder and harder to attack because I had dropped the rook. It became harder and harder because uh, to move because if I gave up the silver, I'd have to make a split move. Even if the situation is a little bad, it's important to leave some means of attack. This is a consequential point. It's an inconsequential point, but it, I think it would have turned out much differently if we played 6 7 silver at some point in the move list. Yeah, I think though, if we'd played 6 7 silver, this would have encouraged. Um, the handicap giver to play much more aggressively on file eight, but could have turned out quite differently. Felt like the pace of the game was quite fast, so I decided against developing the castle. But maybe there was a good moment for it. Could be. I am so grateful that um, yeah, our pro, Madoka, our, <laughs> who heavily promotes the game, is so patient uh, and is glad to go into things in detail for us. Ah, so here's one potential moment for this. Yeah. I mean, during the game, I suggested this but what do i know i suggest a lot of things i also suggested yeah you could play this but then like it's not so easy but what happened in the game was also not so easy so lily was concerned about this possibility yeah I was concerned about it, too, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. So, help us understand this better. I mean, not in this particular position. I... this later on in the game this sequence occurred to me in its different position but in other games this sequence has been quite convincing and i don't know any remedy for it other than run the bishop away and uh, pray so i don't play this castle but you know if we learned more about this maybe we'd play it more This was sent to handicap. I 
It takes guts to play Senta Handicap. Yeah, that was impressive. Yeah, this is, this is fixed Santa. So, I don't know that even's the correct word for that. I think they call it Santa Handicap or fixed Santa. Because um, going first does constitute an advantage. It's still a handicap. Look forward to the translation of this remark. So I see two something something seven five something. This development may be possible. But it would be difficult if you do not take the 7-5 pawn and play other moves. Oh. Okay. Wow. Interesting. That I've not even considered. Like, as long as you don't touch that pawn, um, it's actually a bit difficult for uh, the attacking side there. That's surprising. That's really cool. Sure. Yeah. I'm still working on a patch for the rating system for chess that accounts for that handicap. I implemented it once and messed it up. And I've been too embarrassed to try implementing it again. But maybe sometime again I'll try. I mean, would you disagree with the notion that in Shogi first player constitutes an advantage? I don't think you'd disagree with that. I remember months ago, maybe longer, um... Uh, Spinal Tap at once was so, so excited um, to see a game where uh, Kitao Sensa had been playing and commentating or something. And I remember... I for Was he the one playing? Or just... Or she the one playing? Or... I don't remember... But I do recall that he was so excited by this. This is puts in all caps. Thank you, Kita Sensa. Uh, it's just so delightful. Um. Okay. Well, I'm not the one who makes the rules. But sure, you're entitled to your interpretation. I'm not judging either, but um, let me get through these comments first. It's almost time to go, so I'd like to leave the feedback game at this point. Let's play again somewhere. <laughs> I like that they even say somewhere. Yeah, this, this has some intrigue. Hmm. 
-hmm. <laughs> it's not just some time, but somewhere. I hope that's the correct translation. Oh, that's awesome. Look forward to playing again in the future. Thank you very much. That's very, very kind and awesome and great. All right. Well, then, I guess that about wraps it up for everyone. Um, let's see. Uh, she said, Domo, Arikoko, Arikato, Kazaimashima. Which somehow translates into let's play again somewhere. Interesting. In Latin, Duomo has a meaning, but anyway. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so I guess closing thoughts. Yeah, this is amazing. Um, just this game that's forever been part of Japan has been brought to the rest of the world. And we're doing the best we can to try to enjoy it together. Um, so, yeah, this is a fascinating shape, too. I've often been terrified of this attacking idea. But this particular shape is actually resilient to this attack, given this particular configuration. If the configuration is a little bit different, maybe it's not quite as resilient. But in this case, it, it might be playable, but it's actually difficult for the attacking side here. Who knew? Not me. Um, yeah, so back to earlier comments, which I said I'd get back to. Um, yeah, so the interface and other websites and other commentators will talk about um, Fixed Senta as being a handicap. I don't question it. Yeah, it's different than other handicaps, but it's considered a handicap um, in simuls and chess. Uh, fixing the colors is also considered a handicap. I'm not seeing fit to question any of that being a handicap this time, but you're welcome to your interpretation, but it's just not how I'm going to think about it. Um, sure. Yeah. Anyway, closing thoughts. Thanks very much uh, to uh, all the organizations that helped make uh, today's games possible. With the commentary and translation, as well as uh, the handicap games. It's so surprising to me that this happens and uh, hopefully helps in some small way grow a larger community over time. Um, yeah, hopefully we enjoyed all these games together. I did the best I can to try to comment the games as they're in progress. Although I don't yet know Handicap Joseki and I don't play static rook openings, so we're learning a lot together here. Um, so either way, these are some pretty exciting games. Hope we all enjoyed them together. Thanks for watching. And have a good night.